These days, when it comes to choosing a camera, it is a straight choice between a smartphone or a digital camera. Now, I do have a smartphone, here it is, but I use it for social photography. That is its main strength, because then I can email pictures to friends almost instantly. But when I'm taking pictures for books and magazines and even programs on YouTube here, then it's better if I use a real digital camera as I've got uh, here. That, I think, is the difference, that it a lot depends on what your ambitions are. The smartphone I've got takes excellent pictures, but they are not accepted for commercial publications. Photographic libraries like Alame, if you look at their terms and conditions, do not accept pictures from a smartphone, and neither do many of my clients. Now, you may think it's wrong. You may take a high-handed attitude, but they hold the purse strings. They are only going to pay for what they actually require. And therefore, in choosing a camera, whatever your ambitions are, even as an amateur, which I'll come to in a moment, then the choice of camera, smartphone or digital camera, is important at this stage. After all, you might get bitten by the bug, and what you dreamt of as an amateur becomes successful as a professional. That is something you have to consider. The smartphone is designed for instant photography. Nothing wrong in that, of course. But when it comes to the professional side of photography, it requires a greater input by the user, a better knowledge, particularly for some specialist subjects of photography in itself. Furthermore, by understanding photography, we can combine those skills with post-production work on a computer in programs like, for example, Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. And these are things we can do which we could never do with film, except, of course, the darkroom worker working with prints. They could alter things in the darkroom. Otherwise, these are facilities, wonderful facilities, that we didn't have in our film days. And furthermore, if you were shooting in color transparencies and intending to project them, then once you had taken the picture, that was it. You couldn't change it, or it wasn't very easy anyway. And many people still think today, maybe myself, think that is still real photography, that we do as much as possible in the camera. A common problem today is a lack of understanding of photography. You know what I mean? Apertures and shutter speeds. And when I ran photographic holidays, oh, oh no, we didn't want to learn about that. Anyway, don't worry, Derek, my camera does it all for me. Well, if you want to achieve the perfect average, then who am I to stop you? But if you have designs on going, say, on safari to shoot lions and tigers, then a, special, a more specialist knowledge of photography is essential. Of course, in search of lions and tigers outside safari parks, of course, looking for wildlife, then you can remain in this country. For example, go to Knoll Park in Kent and photograph the deer. What do you need? A very powerful telephoto lens. And what we sometimes don't realise that the use of a powerful telephoto lens increases camera shake. And so we wonder why our pictures are unsharp. And of course, who do we blame? Yes, of course we blame the camera. It's the camera at fault. But really, we don't understand a certain aspect, finer aspects of photography to make a wildlife shoot, even as simple as deer in Knoll Park, to be a success. I'll give you another example where an understanding of photography will give you a better picture. 
I'm sure you've photographed flowers before now, say in a National Trust garden. Now wouldn't the picture look better if you could throw the background out of focus and just have the shrub sharp? This is a snap, this is a photograph. So which do you think is better? With the latter picture I have had controlled apertures. Yes, apertures is half the equation with shutter speeds for creating the correct exposure but they do a lot more than that. You can change, you can alter the depth of field, that is the amount of picture that is sharp from front to back. And by a careful aperture choice I can throw the background out of focus so that the shrub remains sharp. That can be done in camera. But a knowledge, a better knowledge of photography is essential in order to achieve this. A few weeks ago I moved into a new flat. I'm in it now and I'm enjoying it very much indeed. And of course, full of excitement, I produced some instant pictures using my smartphone so that I could email them to my friends so they could see what my new pad looked like. Now, photographically, technically, the pictures have many faults, but I won't go into that here. Nevertheless, nevertheless, if I'm photographing a room in a stately home, which might look a little bit grander than this, then I use my photographic knowledge to get that perfect picture, which afterwards I may have to adjust in post-production. Because whilst I might be looking towards publishing, this is a requirement, an important requirement, if you belong, say, to a camera club and enter their exhibitions and competitions, particularly competitions, your picture might be hacked to bits by the judge, and so therefore your technical knowledge of photography, even as an amateur, becomes increasingly important. I will from time to time mention the benefits of the smartphone, but I am going to concentrate the tuition on a digital camera. And don't think for one moment I'm going to make your life any easier. This is not for instant gratification. There is a serious learning curve here, hopefully to produce images that will not end up forgotten on a hard disk somewhere. And by the way, I'm not going to start by showing you how to take the camera out of the box, neither how to put the batteries in a camera. And on one occasion, when I was teaching photography, I was told off, naughty boy, you hadn't told us how to put the batteries in the camera. But I hope at this stage you actually know how to do that, don't you?